Hi, my name is Paul from Physics High, and today I'm going to go through the HSC exam multiple choice section for the physics paper for 2022. And today I'm going to go through questions 11 through to 20. In this question, we're applying our understanding of graphs. And in this case, we're dealing again with projectile motion from module five, advanced mechanics. And in this case, we have a displacement time graph for a projectile, particularly we're dealing here with the facts just going up and down. And we're asked, what would the velocity time graph look for in this case? Now, mathematically speaking, because the object is heading clearly upward in the positive direction and the fact that the displacement is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and then moving back down in the opposite direction, what that tells us straight away is that our acceleration is a negative value. Now, that means our acceleration is not only negative, but because it's to do with an object in a gravitational field, we do know also that we will assume that the acceleration is a constant value, that is, it does not change. And so a velocity time graph needs to be linear for the first thing, and secondly, it needs to have a slope that is a negative slope. That automatically means our answer is going to be B. If we have a linear relationship that shows that the slope is constant, the acceleration is constant, and we have a negative slope. It starts with a high velocity, it ends up being zero at some point, which is at the top over here, and then of course, of course, it falls back in the downward direction. It's now got a negative velocity, and so therefore it goes down below. Now, again, in this case, we have another charge in a field, but in this case, we have charges in two fields, a magnetic field and an electric field, and therefore, the charges are going to experience some forces. Now, if it's in an electric field, it will always experience a force, irrespective of whether it's moving or not. It needs to be moving to experience a force in a magnetic field, and we're told that, of course, that the velocity is constant, and we do not know which direction it's moving, whether it's moving towards towards that direction or it's moving towards that direction. But the clue here to work out the direction at which it is moving is that it's at constant velocity, which means it's not experiencing a net force, which means that this charge is experiencing two forces, one to the electric field, one to the magnetic field, but they're in opposite directions and equal so that it maintains a constant velocity. Now, if you look at the electric field lines, you can see that the electric field lines are heading downwards. Now, being a positive charge, the lines tell us, as we saw previously, means that's the direction a positive charge will experience. So we know straight away that there is a force downward due to the electric field. We also therefore have a force to oppose that, and that of course is our force due to the magnetic field, and so I'm going to call this Fb, and those two are equal. Now if they are equal, we have a constant velocity. Now that gives us enough information now to work out the direction because our magnetic field lines are going into the page. Now from your perspective, that means they're coming towards me. Now that also means our thumb represents the direction of the motion, but how do we do that? Well, we need a force that is upward. So if I orientate my fingers like this way, you can see now my fingers are coming towards me because of the magnetic field and my charge is moving in that direction. Now that means from your perspective, it's moving towards the right. And so therefore our answer is going to be D. In this question, we have again, two objects moving in orbit around a central body. And we're asked in this case, which of these variables here is different? One for our mass one, which is just one M, and one for our mass two, which is two M. So in other words, if it's gonna be different, it's due to the fact that they are different masses. Well, what determines orbital velocity? Remember from previous topic, we have V equals the square root of G capital M over R. This is often where students can make mistakes. They think, oh, that mass here, that's twice the mass here. But this is the mass of the central body, which is in the center here. The mass of the satellites themselves, or the planets in the orbit around a star, is independent. In other words, it isn't going to affect the motion. And so, because they have the same radius, therefore, their velocities are identical. Now, if their velocities are identical, then they have the same 
circumference divided by the period. So in other words, not only is their velocity identical, their period is also identical. And then finally, the centripetal acceleration, that's V squared over R. And so again, R is the same, V is the same, the centripetal acceleration is the same. And so therefore our only answer is V. The momentum is different between the two. Now in this question, we're dealing with module seven, again, the quantum nature of light. And in this case, what we have is the, the graph that shows us the relationship between the photon energy, the energy of the photoelectrons as they are emitted, and the work function, which is the minimum amount of energy required for my photo electrons to be emitted. Let's remind ourselves of the mathematical relationship. We already have our kinetic energy over here, that's K. And then we have HF, which is the photon energy that the metal is receiving, and then minus the work function. But I'm going to also write it as HF naught. F naught is actually the threshold frequency, the minimum frequency of the photons that we need to have a photoelectrons being emitted. And so that means if we have a high amount of photon energy, then this is not gonna change. This is the constant for that metal. Then the kinetic energy is going to be greater. And so if you follow the line across, that's exactly what it's showing here. And so what we have here is the minimum energy for that particular metal. There's the frequency associated with that. And then anything beyond that, you can see it will have a higher kinetic energy if the photon energy is actually bigger. Now our second graph, our dotted line, the one for Y here, well, what's going on? We see we have a new frequency along here, a new threshold frequency. So in other words, the work function has changed. And so therefore our only answer is going to be B. Now let's have a look at the other responses. For example, it says increasing the frequency. That's going to be just giving us more aspects of the line further and further across. If we're looking at decreasing the intensity of the incident radiation, well, decreasing the intensity decreases the numbers of photons that we have. And so as a result, if you have one photon or whether you have a billion photons or whatever number of photons, you're going to have the same graph here because this is talking about the energy of every photoelectron that we have. And then finally, it says, well, what if I decrease the maximum energy of my photoelectrons? What does that mean? Well, are we slowing the photoelectrons down? They're already emitted. And so we could decrease it if in a photoelectric or photovoltaic cell, we apply an electric field to those photoelectrons, then we're changing the energies, but that's not the case here. So our answer is definitely B. Now, in this case, we have the topic of module six again, electromagnetism, and we're dealing here with a motor effect where we have the force between two current bearing wires. And the force between two current bearing wires is determined by the mathematical formula that the force over the length, the force per unit length, is equal to mu naught over two pi, that is a constant, and then we have I1, I2 over D. That's the mathematical relationship. Now, in this case, what we see is we have the currents going in the same direction for the both wires, separated by a distance of D. What that means is the force will be a force of attraction and they pull towards each other. We're changing the conditions. We're increasing the current for both by a factor of two, and we're separating them by a factor of four. So mathematically, what are we doing to this formula? Well, we're multiplying this by two, we're multiplying this by two, and we're mul multiplying this by four, and it goes in the bottom. But can you see what happens? We have a two and a two, which is four, and a four down the bottom, so they're gonna cancel out. So there's going to be no change whatsoever. The answer is A. Now in this question, we're dealing now with module eight, and we're specifically interested in the concept of binding energy. Now, what is the definition of binding energy? Because that's the key to solving this particular question. Binding energy is the amount of energy required to break an atom apart into its constituted parts. So if I have four nucleons, which is the case for helium, if I put amount of energy in and I want to break them up into my two protons and two neutrons, the energy that I need to break them apart is the binding energy. 
Now, interestingly enough, the mass of the part afterwards is greater than the mass of what we started off with. And what that means is that binding energy I put into the system has resulted to an increase in mass. But that's another topic. Now, we are given the actual value of the binding energy for helium and for the binding energy of beryllium. And since the binding energy of helium is actually larger value than the binding energy of beryllium, automatically we can see that the first statement is correct for A, and that is also true for C. What about the second statement? Well, which is heavier? Well, heavier is beryllium because it's six nucleons versus four nucleons for my helium. So automatically my HE is less massive and therefore our answer is going to be A. So here we're dealing with a question dealing with module seven, uh, the nature of light, but dealing specifically with the wave nature of light. And we're dealing here with polarization. And we're told here we have a polarizer and we have some input of light which has certain amount of intensity, which is I naught. So I naught is going to be the same, obviously, for the two paths that we have here. And now this polarizer is free to turn and that becomes relevant in a moment. And then we have two intensity out here. Now they're going to be exactly the same because they're passing through the same filter and no matter what way we turn it, the Ix will always be a fraction of I0. In fact, it's always going to be a half. Now then that passes through our polarizers from our glasses, but you'll notice that these are now 90 degrees out of phase. And so we're asked what happens to Iy, the intensity Y and intensity Z, and then how do we compare those? Well, let's leave it in this particular position. You can see that currently that's vertically aligned and the filter over here is also vertically aligned. So in this case, our IY, our intensity of Y, is exactly the same as our intensity X. Whereas here, they're 90 degrees difference. And so therefore, in this case, IY will be half of the original, I0, but IZ will be zero because of the fact that this is now 90 degrees difference. What if I turn this now 90 degrees? Well, then the reverse happens. I Y now becomes 90 degrees out of phase with the initial polarizer, and therefore you'll get nothing here. And IZ now will be I over two or I naught over two. It'll be basically just parallel to what we have now over here. And then what we have is, well, what if we rotate it only 45 degrees? And that means both filters will be 45 degrees from this original filter. And so that means you're going to get, according to Malice's law, exactly the same intensity between IY and IZ. So the only possible answer really is going to be, if you look at our responses, is going to be C. IY sometimes equals IZ. Now, in this particular experiment, we're dealing with the experiment of Robert Millikan, which is found in Module 8, where we're looking at Robert Millikan's work and understanding the discrete nature of the electrical charge. In other words, what is the fundamental unit of charge, or at least for the electron? Now, what did he do? Well, he charged oil droplets and placed them in a chamber where he could apply an electric field or not apply an electric field. So let's quickly draw what we have. So we can have no electric field, and then we can have an electric field being on. So let's talk about what forces our oil droplets will experience. And so let's draw our oil droplet here and our oil droplet here. Now what he noticed is that when the electric field was off, then the oil droplet was falling, as the instructions say, was falling at a constant rate. That means the forces that it was experiencing were equal and opposite, therefore no net force. But what forces are acting? Well, first of all, there is the force due to gravity that we have but it's moving at constant velocity. Well, there is a force due to friction, which is the air resistance, which we're gonna call F. We're gonna be consistent with the letters that we have here. So automatically you can see that FG is equal to FF. Now, what about when the electric field is applied? Well, we found that it was started to move upward. Being negatively charged, we had an electric field that was acting downwards, but it was experiencing a force in the upward direction that is now due to the electric field. But it was moving at a constant velocity. Well, that means there is a force, obviously, still of gravity acting downwards, 
but it's now going in the opposite direction. So there's still some friction due to the air resistance. So we also have the force due to the frictional forces acting downwards. So you can see mathematically here that the force of the electric field is equal to the sum of the force due to the gravitational field and the force due to the friction. And so, so automatically you can see what our response is going to be. The answer is going to be B. Now in this question we're dealing with a little bit of year 11 stuff where we're dealing with basically Ohm's law and I'll explain that in a moment. Let's talk about what the situation states here. We have a crank, we have an AC generator and that causes a loop of wire to rotate in a magnetic field and we're going to get a rate of change of flux. So delta phi over delta t and of course the negative represents Lenz's law and that means we have an EMF generated. Now that means that EMF actually attributes to what we refer to as the applied voltage. Now that voltage will be applied to each of these two situations which results in the fact that we have an applied voltage onto some resistors. We're going to get an electrical current because there's a load on both of those we can talk about Ohm's law here. Now, we're told here that it's spinning both of them at the same rate. So we're going to get the same applied voltage here. So let's say we have the applied voltage for this one over here, and we have the applied voltage for this one over here. And we know that what the current that we get is determined by the resistance. Now, over here we have one bulb. So let's call that resistance of that bulb just simply R. Now the resistance over here means therefore we have 2R. Now that means our voltage divided by our resistance, which is R, gives us our current. Now in this case our current is going to be our voltage divided by 2R. And so now what you can see is that if this is I, I now have I over 2. In other words, the amount of electrical current I get in this one is actually less. Now, what about the power? Well, power is equal to simply VI. And so here we have VI. And so the amount of energy transferred per second is going to be VI. Similarly speaking, our power here is going to be, but hold on, it's VI over 2. Now, where does that electrical energy come from? Well, it's a transformation. And it's because you, as you're turning our generator, are doing work on it. And work is force times displacement. You can think of it that way. So whatever work you do, the rate at which you do that work is resulting without any I'm talking about losses of energy in the system here, due to the fact that, that we're getting a power here and a power here. The power is less here which means the work that you have to put into the system is going to be less per second. And so that means it's going to be easier. You're going to have to apply less force, less torque really, because it's rotating in the second situation than in the first situation. And that means our answer is going to be A. We now come to the last question of the 2022 multiple choice section. And here we have a wheel that is moving. And in this case, we're tying in the concept of special relativity that basically said that if you measure or observe something that is moving, then what happens is certain variables change due to either in terms of time, there's time dilation. If you measure, for example, length, we have length contraction. And if you look at momentum, what you measure is the momentum dilation. Now, strictly speaking, you can't directly observe length contraction as it happens. But assuming that we could, how would the positions for our P, Q and R compare if we had, let's say, a little stick that was a centimeter at each of those sections. Well, the key thing is, is what's the motion of the three relative to you? Now, the wheel is turning, but it's actually not moving relative to you at P. So the velocity here, for your perspective, at any instant time is the same as the road, because the velocity here is zero. Over here, we have a slightly higher velocity because it is now moving in that direction. But that aspect over here, because it's actually further away, is actually rotating at that point at a much higher velocity as a, a result. Now, the length contraction formula says that the length that is measured is equal to the original length in the rest frame multiplied 
by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now the velocity here is greater, so therefore you will get length contraction. The greater the velocity, the greater the contraction. And that means you'll have no change in terms of p. You'll have a small change, slightly smaller, for q and the larger change for r. And therefore our answer is b. Now, I hope that's been helpful for you. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and press that bell to so, so that you get my latest updates. And please consider supporting me by buying me coffee if this has been particularly helpful for you. I value your support. My name is Paul from Physics High. Take care and bye for now.